No event transformed the American landscape more than the Civil War. The basics are common knowledge. A nation divided, bloody battles, and Lincoln's America crushes the CSA in a submission. This is, well, true to some extent, but the words grossly oversimplified don't even begin to describe it. Setting up the background is no easy task. From stories of bleeding Kansas to general Southern animosity, it's hard to detail everything that led up to the event. But that's not really what I want to talk about. What about the war itself? Self. What did it mean? And do we really talk about it accurately today? Removing the human morality element of it, it was about the South trying to maintain the institution of slavery. This institution brought wealth to many upper-class citizens and allowed the American South to become one of the most productive geopolitical areas in the world. Slavery was a contentious issue for many in America, and not just in the middle of the 1800s. Since the foundation of the country, the concept of equality was called into question. If all are equal, then how can some be property? It was a direct conflict with the nation's ideals, yet its influence and wealth brought to slaveholders made it virtually impossible to end without bringing the nation to potential collapse. As the 19th century wore on, attempts were made to limit its growth. By 1808, no slaves could be imported into the nation made law under Thomas Jefferson, a slaveholder himself. In fact, men like Benjamin Franklin, a noted abolitionist, owned slaves at one point. This seems counterintuitive. How could men that argued for an egalitarian ideal, equality for all, allow this institution to run free? Well, money, and not just personal wealth, while that was sometimes a contributing factor. As I said, the South was an economic powerhouse, one of the biggest in the world. Eli Whitney's cotton gin would make slavery more profitable than ever. To ask the South to free the slaves would be to ask them to destroy their livelihoods, and with this, the institution survived. As the decades went on, new states were gradually added to the U.S. Conflicts between whether these would be free or slave states led to violence and deaths, bleeding Kansas. It's all stuff I'm sure you've heard before. There wasn't a definitive side for or against equality. No, nearly nobody was arguing equality. Freeing slaves and equal rights were two entirely different concepts. Instead, the question was on whether owning a human was morally right, not whether they were your equal. Abolitionism called to end all slavery. This was often rooted in religious beliefs that slavery was a sin. While a viewpoint not held by everybody, or indeed most people, this belief would become contorted in the southern slaveholder's mind. To them, it was a called rebellion to his property. As any political divide starts, the animosity grew. The idealized southerner or northerner was basically a cartoon-like figure, one-dimensional and ignorant. Not universally to all, of course, many northerners didn't care whether slavery remained or not. To the South, though, it was not just helpful to the economy, it was absolute necessity. As the decades waned, and violence and stories and tragedy would convince the American public that change was needed, it was coming. This all began to culminate in a single event, the election of 1860. With an incumbent who had been doing little to nothing to ease national agitation, it seemed as though the fate of the country would lean on who became his successor. You had John Breckinridge, a Southern Democrat who functioned as Buchanan's vice president. He was the Southern favorite and more or less campaigned on the idea that there was no legal way to remove slavery in the South. Also from the South was John Bell, a slaveholder who had no particular interest in banning or keeping slavery. The Democrats had Stephen Douglas, who was pretty divisive to everybody. He had argued the Constitution and its rights only applied to whites, which had Southern appeal, but had also not gone very far in expressing desire to keep slavery around. So who was left? Of course, it was Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln argued consistently that slavery was wrong. He believed that at some point it should end, but not necessarily anytime soon. He believed freed slaves should be sent back to the African continent and create their own state rather than stay in America. He certainly wasn't one to argue for equality, but he saw slavery as a morally unjust practice. He also saw slavery as a potentially dangerous interpretation of the Constitution. If some humans could be owned based on ethnicity, why not religious groups like Catholics? Why not the often despised Irish? This seems preposterous now, but political groups such as the Know Nothing Party were starting to go down this path. Anyway, the South saw Lincoln as nothing short of Satan himself. He was perceived as the culmination of everything wrong with the North. As the election came up, he didn't even appear on Southern state ballot. But even with this, there were just too many candidates at play. 
Lincoln swept the North, but won less than 40% of the popular vote. The other three candidates just kind of cannibalized themselves. Most strange of all, while Southerners feared Lincoln was to mandate freedom of slaves, which would occur later as a wartime move, he would have never actually done anything of the sort if it were to cause separation of the Union. He was not a hardcore abolitionist. In fact, he didn't consider himself an abolitionist at all. Once Abraham Lincoln won the election, this is when chaos breaks out. Southern slaveholders and influential socialites fear he will be the end to Southern prosperity. As fears grow, one state takes the first step in what they see as the only logical progression. South Carolina secedes the Union. Many at the time would argue it's the inherent right of each state to own slaves under the Fugitive Slave Clause. Article 4, Section 2 of the Constitution states effectively that nobody who is owned in a state permitting slavery who escapes said state is actually free, instead must be returned to their owner. This argument sparks whether slavery is a state right or a federal right. Either way, many Southerners view Lincoln as nothing short of a king breaking the laws set forth previously. More states, Alabama, Virginia, Georgia, and others joined in secession. With this, they grew into a federal government of their own, the Confederate States of America. Texas's governor, Sam Houston, was not pleased. A slaveholder himself, he feared only the worst could come of this divide. He feared war would break out and the U.S. would not concede this act of rebellion. He refused to join the Confederacy, but the anger and emotion of so many others led to his expulsion from office. As Lincoln was inaugurated, he understood the dire situation he was forced to fix. He sought out one goal, save the Union, restore the states that had left. He is quoted saying he would not care if any slaves were freed, or remained. All he wanted was the unification of America. The North had a goal, a promise to itself. You see, this event became a bit of a global phenomenon. America had inspired so many that a nation based upon more than just a handful of rightfully endowed leaders could make its way forward that presidents enter and leave office when the public decides. With this conflict, it became apparent that political disputes could cause secession. This ideal was dissolving. The cynical of Europe saw it as just plainly expected. Those not born to rule cannot rule, and a nation cannot solve its own problems. That is left to socialites, the aristocracy. By this point, violence had not occurred on a federal level. War had not started, but it was obvious what was coming. The culmination of this was on April 11th, 1861. In Confederate-controlled Charleston, South Carolina, Fort Sumter was still occupied by Union forces. With this, soldiers were sent to remove them. With the Union forces unwilling to comply, obviously, shots broke out. And for over a day and a half, the conflict went on. No deaths happened during the battling itself, although the surrender salutes ended up killing two. It wasn't the deaths that made the impact. No, it was the fact that now Americans were now fighting. Less than 100 years ago, America had won its freedom, but now the divide between North and South made these United States less so. The impact of the American Civil War is more substantial than often given credit. The repercussions will go on to affect not just the 19th century, but the 20th, and even this century. The fact that, in the end, America stayed one country changed not just the lives of its citizens, but most citizens of the entire world. So going forward, I want to look at the progression of the war, both sides, their values, intentions, and the impact of the areas they controlled. My intention is to at least try and remain objective, present the facts, rather than offer my own two cents. Morality in war is not one-sided. Both sides did tragic things, that goes undisputed, but when discussed, it often seems like it's presented through the lens of subjectivity, rather than the morally grave reality it actually was. I will at least intend to be different than this. Not to praise or rip on one side, but instead present information. This is Tyler of Knowledge Hub.